Given a lot of the hinting and the direction that the story has gone uh, with the main narrative in Path of Fire, I thought it was time to talk about one of the more interesting components, and that's to do with another of the human gods. We've obviously just dealt a lot with Balthazar, but today I want to talk a lot about Lyssa. I want to teach you who Lyssa is, and I want to explain why Lyssa might have a more prominent role than you'd expect upcoming in the story sometime, hopefully, quite soon soon. So, why a Lissa spotlight? Why now? Well, really, this has its roots, I think, not just in the core story of Path of Fire, but in Living World Season 3 also, where she's continually had particularly different and interesting things going on with her. So, uh, first of all, the main thing you guys will know as of the main story, and there will be spoilers in this video for what it's worth, uh, as we went into it, is that Balthazar had been hiding on Tyria as a Massat, as Lazarus the Dyer. The way that he accomplished this was with a magical artifact, a mirror that uh, shielded his true form from our eyes. A mirror that I can't quite remember the fate of now, actually. Did we shatter it when we decloaked him? We didn't necessarily get to interact with it too much. But this mirror Balthazar used was not of his own power. And in fact, we know he was a fallen god and had very limited power, at least before he consumed the bloodstone, probably. But this was actually power from another of the gods. This was Lissa's mirror. And so that immediately is really quite interesting, isn't it? It seems to suggest there was probably a collaboration between these two. And all of this stuff we've seen going with, on with Balthazar and his motives, there might be more than meets the eye. Now, you might also question that there could have been a collaboration. You might say, oh, well, maybe Balthazar didn't collaborate with Lissa. Maybe when he came back to Tyria, after being unchained by Ritlock, as we now know, maybe he just went to the reliquaries in si uh, Siren's Landing. He went to Lissa's reliquary. He found a mirror of hers there. There was uh, no foul play from Lissa. She's got no real idea uh, that any of it happened, and he just grabbed it. And while I think that that is a worthwhile theory and there's space for it, I have to question whether that would be true in terms of this being a constructed narrative and a product that writers are behind because if that was true and it really is this kind of benign answer why wouldn't that have been explained already in the sirens landing release because if there's no more to it than just oh he grabbed it then the perfect opportunity to give that to us was sirens landing at the point of one path ends we knew balthazar's true identity it could have been even more interesting stuff we could have found out while we're there in awe but the devs let that opportunity pass them up and so for that reason i actually think that there is a very real hint here that Lyssa personally gave Balthazar this mirror, that he didn't just pick it up on his own when he, you know, went to those reliquaries, that something more may have been going on. And indeed, going into Path of Fire, I really thought that was one of the things the expansion was going to discuss. Why does Balthazar have Lyssa's mirror? And then, of course, perhaps more importantly, but associated with this, why did he feel the need that he had to hide in the first place? Uh, and we can speculate there that it's because he didn't want the other gods to notice and then you can counter that argument by saying, well, but none of the gods are looking at all. And then you can counter that again and say, maybe one of the gods is on Tyria and hiding among us, at which point we come back to Lyssa. And these theories that Jenna or Anise or both of them could actually be that goddess herself. But let's put a pin in that for a second. We're probably going a bit deep. The point is, Path of Fire never really answered that stuff, even though there was this presumed connection. Then it went a little bit further, and this is where I think things get really interesting and why it really might be worth us looking uh, more at this character here. Because there were several times in Path of Fire where Lyssa is explicitly described as kind of the odd one out and separate from the other gods. So the first time you see this happen uh, a couple of times is in the library of Cormir. Cormir herself is talking about the collective decision amongst the gods to cast Balthazar down, to chain him up and to strip him of his powers. Uh, they, the story doesn't really describe how they were able to do that. Uh, when they did that with Abaddon to imprison him, it was a massive war and this time they kind of gloss over that. But uh, as Cormir is describing this collective decision, she says, eventually even Lyssa agreed. And there's a suggestion here, it's either two things. One, that Lyssa always disagrees, 
and uh, you know she she agreed on this one or that and I think this is the more poignant one and the, the actual thing that the devs are probably driving at that Lissa had some kind of deeper respect or reason for being on Balthazar's side than the others that Balthazar ha had some connection with Lissa and eventually even she agreed to cast Balthazar down suggesting there's a little bit more of something going on between the two of them so uh, that, I think, is a red flag that something more might be going on. Uh, and then moments later as well, in the same instance, I believe it is, uh, but Cormier is talking about how she has remained in the library and she still kind of feels this connection with the humans and doesn't want to move on so fast. And Cormier mentions that Lyssa even mocked her for this, uh, which is funny because our original understanding of Lyssa as a goddess, which I'll get into in a second, uh, Lyssa always seemed very close to humanity, much like Cormier. If you were going to guess any of the gods would linger around, it would probably be Lissa just as much as Cormier, um, but Lissa was mocking her for feeling this kind of attachment. So once again, the devs are making us think more about Lissa than the other gods. Uh, and then it gets most juicy and most interesting, I think, at the end. Now, there could be other bits of lore. I've still not managed to get all of the lore books associated with the maps and so forth, so we could build he more heavily on this. But at the very end uh, of the story, Balthazar is ranting and rambling, and he's cursing all of the gods. And so this is a moment in the story where you can actually interrupt his dialogue by uh, finishing the fight, essentially. Um, but if you let him ramble long enough, he will name each of the gods by their name. And he will call for, uh, against Dwayna, and he'll curse Melanju, and he'll curse Cormir, Grenth, but he won't curse Lyssa. He leaves her name out. Now, you might think that that's just the devs forgot to put it there or they didn't recall all those lines, but to me, I think this is a real hint that there's something deeper going on. Because again, to return to um, what we were expecting going into Path of Fire in terms of questions answered, there's still a lot we don't know about why Balthazar was the kind of cartoonish, angry villain that he was. We still don't quite know why he hid. And the game itself has allowed us to ask NPCs this question who will ruminate upon potential answers with us. But it shows, I think, that the devs want us to continue to be asking this. And I think there's a bigger picture. I think there's something more happening here. And I think it's to do with Lyssa, uh, a god a goddess that already had fan theories revolving around her due to uh, the power of Queen Jenna and uh, Anise to a lesser extent as well. So uh, I want to talk a little bit about us. A lot of you guys might not um, be totally in the loop. She's actually been my favorite goddess, an interesting goddess to me. Uh, for my entire time playing this franchise. Now, these days, there's all this interesting stuff to talk about. I make no bones about the fact I really only liked Lyssa for the longest time because I was a Mesmer main in Guild Wars 1. And in Guild Wars 1, at least for the original six classes, well, all of them really, different attributes were uh, accorded to different gods. The gods kind of had patronage over each of the classes and uh, Mesmers were really kind of Lyssa's babies. So this goddess is described as a twin goddess of beauty and illusion. The motivations and capabilities and aspirations of the Pantheon have always been very inscrutable in this franchise, but of all of them, Lyssa is kind of the one that's most difficult to decipher. Lyssa is all about this idea of illusion and never quite knowing what's really going on. The idea that if you try to understand her, you will be run wrong footed and then again and then again and then again. In short, I've always seen Lyssa uh, as this representation of illusion to uh, be at her very core a celebration of what it is to not truly know something like she is a question mark incarnate and so uh, I, I described her a second ago as a twin goddess right uh, the prophecies manuals describing the gods uh, lay this down immediately uh, even that the, the, the idea of her what is her corporeal form even that uh, is kind of something to question so she's referred to as a singular goddess but has also many times, and depending on what way you look at it, she's referred to as twins, like two separate goddesses that are somehow bound into one entity. Uh, and those twins have even been so far as been named in Guild Wars in the past, like Lys and Ilya, or is it Lys and Issa? I can't remember. Even the names have always been a bit weird. Uh, the devs eventually, uh, recently in an AMA, stuck their flag in one of them, which I found quite unfortunate. But that's what's fun about her, right? Like the idea of, is she a twin or is she a single thing? It's a conceptual impossibility that we can enjoy 
from that conceptual level. Like, I've always taken it to be, like, vaguely metaphorical, and it's principally about making her very essence indecipherable and illusory. Uh, these days, though, in the community, I've noticed a lot more people uh, just enjoying, like, that blunt force logic idea that, no, she is twins, this is fact, she is not one thing, she is just two twins that, like, hold hands a lot. Uh, I don't like that so much, but I guess it's up to you. Uh, how exactly you want to uh, take that. So in Prophecies, right at the start of the franchise, we got these little things called scriptures about the gods, which give you an overview of what they were like on their time when they lived amongst the Tyrians and they lived in awe. So uh, this is Lissa's scripture. I always take great joy in reading this. Uh, it's a story about Lissa when she was on Tyria. It says this, And it was that a stranger came to the village of Wren seeking shelter and employment. Though young in years, her body was stooped and twisted, her flesh eaten by disease. Ye have the mark of the plague upon ye, said the citizen named Galric. Leave this place, lest you sicken our people. I have lost my family and my home, cried the desperate woman. Have you no hearts? Yet each person in turn did look away. Then from the crowd came a young woman. Sarah. She looked upon the woman with pity. If you need help, said Sarah, I will give it. And Sarah did approach the gnarled, bent woman and did offer her a helping hand. Then the sickened woman pulled from her body the robes of plague, revealing herself to be the goddess Lyssa. And the people of Wren fell to their knees, begging Lyssa's mercy. But lifting Sarah gently, saith she, True beauty is measured not by appearance, but by actions and deeds. Many have eyes, but few have seen. Of all here, you saw the beauty behind the illusion, and you alone shall be blessed with my gifts. Now, in 2012, there was some extra uh, detail about this story. Um, there's kind of a suggestion that many of the gods lived in Ara, but Lissa would live among the people for much longer. Uh, maybe this was only while Ara was under construction, maybe not, I'm not quite sure on the details at this point, I think most people aren't. But there is this idea that she had this connection with people and uh, she lived among them. Maybe um, she, she faked her appearance as she did so, but she was that kind of connection. She's described as being humanity's hope, right? And um, so this kind of is a nice story to think about when you think of the gods leaving Tyria and the hu humans receding and losing their hope. You can kind of think it's as they've lost their connections with this specific goddess. Um, so that's why I said at the start of this video, it kind of would have made sense for her to have... Uh, uh, been around on Tyria for longer and do a bit like what uh, something a bit like what Cormir did with the library there. Um, so there was also another cool thing that came from Lissa as well. Um, very recently, episode six was great because it gave us kind of new versions of the scripts. Um, and we got parables, if you guys remember. So there was a parable. Uh, many of you would have heard me read this quite recently, but I'll go again. Um, so this is another story about Lissa. Uh, and it goes like this. From out of the darkness, there stepped a child into the campfire's light, and she said, I am Lyssa, and I have come to teach you what is illusion and what is truth. But the soldiers there did not believe her. They laughed and said, If you're Lyssa, then show us your beauty, for we can surely use it on this dark night. We have lost hope that this war will end. Then the child approached, and her smile held divine grace. Share your food with me, and in return for your kindness, I will show you beauty the likes of which you will never see again. And so the kind soldiers did, and the child ate with ravenous hunger. When the last bone had been tossed aside and the last bean swallowed, the child began to skip around the, ca the outside of the campfire. She touched each man on his head, one at a time, as they laughed and jibed her, until one at a time they fell into a deep slumber. Each man dreamed a different dream, but each dream was a vision of the life they would lead once the war was over. Wives, children, riches, open air, health and peace. And when they awoke upon the morrow, the child was gone, and the enemy had arrived. They fought joyfully with all their might, because they remembered their dreams, and they knew they would win the war. Each man put his heart and soul into the battle, and each man, one at a time, was slaughtered. That's a great story. Uh, I remember reading that quite recently, and uh, people came with these excellent I interpretations. If you listen back earlier, Lissa says that uh, I will show you something you'll never see again, and then they all die and they never do see it again. You know, there's a lot of different ways to take it. But so now you know the kind of god that we're dealing with, right? She has slightly different depictions in Cantha and Alona. Specifically Alona, though, which is the region of the world path the fire has taken us to, 
um, she had a, a much greater connection with, specifically Vabi. So the people of Vabi today care mostly about Palawa Joko, obviously, but 250 years ago, and presumably for the thousand years before that, the people of Vabi really cared about Lissa. It was said that it was Lissa's blessed land, that uh, all the beauty and things you saw there uh, were because of her as its patron goddess. Uh, the people really revered her. The mirror of Lis itself, a lake was named for her, uh, and even there's a great festival that we get to experience in Goodall's Island called the Festival of Lis. Um, the Festival of Lis presumably isn't practiced in Vabi anymore in Guild Wars 2, but I find it interesting to think that maybe in Season 4 we could hit that time of year again and the Festival of Lis could come and we could get a bit more information about her. I've found it quite interesting that in Guild Wars 2 there's so little about Lis that left over from her that Joko has so beautifully managed to completely change the culture there. And I wonder whether they'll uh, deal with that a little bit more. Um, but so there is that kind of strong connection. And I think that's more reason to believe maybe she's got some uh, extra avenue into it, worming her way into the story here. So another interesting mystery about Lissa, you guys might want to keep in mind as you think about what could be going on here, uh, is actually a story from between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2. So we have Abaddon, a, a god that rebelled just as, as Balthazar seems to have now. Um, Abaddon, the god of secrets and water. Now, Cormir takes that power at the end of Nightfall, and in the 250 years between Guild Wars 1 and Guild Wars 2, we hear that Cormir gives that power of water away, and she actually gives it up to Lyssa. So how that works, why that works, and what was genuinely going on back there, we have no clue as to, but it was something the devs specifically went out of their way to write about. And I have to wonder why, how has that ever impacted the Guild Wars 2 story? How, why wouldn't they have just left it as, yeah, Cormir is the goddess of water and uh, be happy with that. So maybe that old oddball, that thing that they had been thinking about back when they conceived the world of Guild Wars 2 so many years ago, might have some kind of explanation or, or wriggle point into the, the stories they're dealing with right now. So something to think about. Another really interesting thing about Lissa that I quite like at the moment um, is each god kind of was a patron of a different area, right? Like, so fire magic was kind of Balthazar's domain. Uh, and so when we think of like earthy magic, it was Melanju. And when we think of air, it was Duena. Uh, but what about Lissa? So Lissa was kind of like the extra one out. Um, and she was actually kind of the patron of chaos. Um, and so Mesmers in Guild Wars 1, they were inflicting chaos damage, which in terms of game mechanics just meant they bypassed armor, basically. Um, but chaos magic has had a lot more uh, development in Guild Wars 2. Um, research into chaos magic was what was happening at the Thormanova reactor. There have been comparisons made between chaos magic and dragon magic. Um, and then further, we've also got something else to consider. And that's that as we've been destroying Elder Dragons and chaos has begun to unfold on Tyria, and these anomalies are appearing and there's chaotic unbound magic, we're looking at a lot of chaos magic, no? At least I think it's supposed to be chaos magic. So if Lyssa is kind of the patron of that area, like what, what does that mean? Does that mean that she, she would actually relish in the deaths of more elder dragons as that's kind of her domain? Is this why potentially she could have been helping Balthazar? She could have been trying to manipulate things in that way? Uh, and so there's lots of little uh, avenues we can go in. And so I do hope that as the story goes forward, we start to look into these things a little bit more. I do think the devs have been deliberately setting something up. I'm really curious about how they handle it and uh, definitely answers as to how Balthazar got the mirror, as long as it's not this very boring idea that he just got it from a reliquary that they could have told us earlier, uh, and how exactly as well he was left where he was in the mist. See, there have been some people criticizing the story, saying, wow, um, Abaddon was chained up in X, Y, and Z fashion in the realm of torment, but they've just left Balthazar in the middle of nowhere for Ritlock to just stumble upon him. Uh, isn't that terrible writing? Maybe, or maybe something bigger is at play here and Lissa kind of orchestrated things such that Ritlock would happen upon Balthazar and Ritlock would be able to free Balthazar and uh, all of it would happen as it happened. Maybe there was some greater manipulation going on here um, and maybe that explains how Balthazar immediately had the mirror when he got to Tyria and so forth. So there you go guys, uh, just a little bit of a talk about Lissa, some of the things that I was thinking of and chewing on as I was playing through Path of Fire. Really interested in what you all think on the comments on this one. Is there any other big thing, uh, suggestion or hint about this one god that I've missed, uh, I'd be very curious to hear. 
Sorry that the uh, footage in the background was a little bit irrelevant here. I don't have anything of the library, so uh, I guess we'll just be watching some open world stuff. And uh, yeah, until tomorrow, everybody, I hope you enjoyed. Thanks very much for watching, and I'll see you shortly.